Um, next up, we're going to have Radhakrishna Sanka on open source microfluidics. Um, if you were worried that earlier Leon didn't cover CAD tools for microfluidics design, fret not, because we're going to learn about the humorously named um, Fluigi CAD. <laughs> Thank you, Krishna. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, so Fluigi is like a play on Luigi, and, you know, uh, my advisor was a big fan, fan of Mario, so that's how it ended up. But today I'm here to talk about, like, the entire open source CAD ecosystem that I've been building throughout my PhD. And I'm really excited to like talk to everyone about this. So uh, just to give you some background about me. So I started doing some electronics in my undergrad, like, you know, analog, digital, name it. Then I went out once I graduated, built some cool electronics and software systems. So for some space related applications, then I came back from the masters to Boston University tried doing more electronics, got bored, ended up doing some photonic stuff. And then finally ended up doing my PhD in the synthetic biology lab. And instead of doing anything in biology, I started doing work in like microfluidics and how to make, uh, how to engineer them much easier. Now, for those of you all who don't know anything about microfluidics, you know, it's fairly simple as just this picture says. They're basically small plastic devices you where you can insert tiny volumes of fluid into it. And you know, these devices can manipulate and sense those fluids, and that's essentially one of microfluidic devices. Now, if you're thinking about where you use them, everything ranging from your glucose sensors, if we ever manage to miniaturize our COVID testing, PCR microarrays, and if you've seen these things in like the Smithsonian or magazines, uh, wearable devices, which can be used to like monitor what hormones levels you have, like what your blood pressure is looking like, all kinds of crazy stuff. So, and that's what microfluidics are, like in diagnostics. But you might be wondering, why is Krishna, you know, like in the synthetic biology lab, where do they care about microfluidics? Well, we think of microfluidics as a lab on a chip because you can basically do all the operations on a chip. Now, in the three videos you see on the right, imagine each one of those droplets to be a biological sample. And these videos are like slowed down by about like 200 times, which means that by the time hey, you uh, blink Krishna, an eye, your uh, slides, I think you're sharing not the screen that shows the slides. We just see the overview. Maybe you could switch back or share the, share the, sh the, the presentation part of the screen. Oh, shoot. So sorry. Yeah, no worries. Screen. I'm going to share the entire window. That way it'll probably just work. Can you see the screen? Uh, perfect. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. So why do I care about microfluidics? Uh, it's because we think of microfluidics to be like a lab on a chip. Now, if you see the three videos on the right, you'll actually kind of see You'll actually imagine each one of these droplets to be like a single uh, biological sample that you're experimenting. Oops, sorry, got canceled. Uh, uh, imagine each one of these droplets to be like a single biological experiment you're trying to test. And that means within the blink of an eye, you can actually run about like a thousand tests. And this is something that is unheard of in like in the field of doing any kind of biological engineering. And if some of you are biohackers in the room, you might be remembering all those nights you were pipetting volume, uh, small volumes of fluid from one well to another. And that's the hope. We, can, we want to accelerate how fast you do this. Now, microfluidics have been around for like the last you know, 30, 35 years. So you would imagine every you know, pharmaceutical biology lab to look something like this. You know, huge data centers where you're just generating more and more biological data. But, you know, the reality is kind of looks like this, you know, with the hodgepodge of lab equipment, you see a microwave there. I'm not even sure what they use a microwave for to tell the truth. But the reason why this didn't really happen was because creating microfluidics is a multidisciplinary process. Most people who make these devices have a PhD in something and spend their entire PhD or uh, spend a lot of time learning how to do these devices. And the second part is that there's a fractured supply chain. It's not easy to make these devices between all the different kinds of materials you need to have. And so, you know, if you didn't have like a billion dollars, like me, I didn't have a billion dollars, you were like, how do we fix this problem? 
the answers are for me was let's build design automation tools that will get rid of like this multidisciplinary expertise requirement because I didn't have any. So I need to figure out a way to make this easier for myself. And the second part was let's make this open source and maker friendly because you know that way it's easier to source more components. We can easily make devices and everybody else can replicate making these devices. And so what we basically needed was this entire open ecosystem for making this stuff. And so the first problem was, you know, making this stuff uh, hardware, maker friendly hardware, right? And the big problem was standardize this entire hardware design. Now, the thing is that in microfluidics, it's rapidly evolving based on what applications you use, what manufacturing technique you have, between industry and academia, you have the most favorite manufacturing method every six months. And that was becoming a problem because in my lab, we were saying, oh, let's get rid of all this expensive equipment and let's use something as simple as a CNC mill and duct tape to actually start making like microfluidic devices. And I was like, okay, I really need to get my A game up because nothing is constant in this field. So what I basically went around and did was, okay, let's rethink how we draw these devices, right? So rather than using like SolidWorks and making these designs, I basically said, let's think of this entire design to be like components and connections and layers, just like how we have in electronics. And then what I said was, because each and every one of these uh, components will have a specific uh, manufacturing protocol, we can basically track which manufacturing method is manufacturable by, and that way we were able to like make sure that you know you could create a design and ensure that it's manufactured by a specific technique or whether it's laser cutting or cnc milling or you know like some kind of photolithography method and so with that we took all of this information and then what i did was we created this tool called 3 duff which is an open source interactive design tool which is available online right now to actually go ahead and create designs. And it basically captures all the manufacturing protocols uh, which are related to each one of these components and made like a DIY place and connect kind of a tool, which even like high schoolers can use to make microfluidic device designs. Now, uh, what this design, which over here would have taken like a couple of hours to make in like, you know, SolidWorks or AutoCAD, took me around 20 minutes to actually do with all the mistakes happening and me making changes midway. So with this entire tool, you, you'd be like, okay, this is cute, you know, it is open source, but did we actually make anything useful with it? Well, useful is a hard thing to beat, but we made some really cool applications. Like in 2017, some of my undergrads started working on this project called Mars, where they wanted to make small lab automation microfluidics to automate the protocols which you do in synthetic biology. And more recently, some of my undergrads who are working on this right now are making this super portable mRNA encapsulation device, which in principle would make mRNA encapsulation possible anywhere in the world. So you could actually do distributed biomanufacturing. Now, the second part of this was I needed to eliminate this expert training business, right? Like, you know, I didn't have like three degrees in material sciences and everything. I kind of knew ins and outs of different stuff, but, you know, I was no expert. So I was like, okay, what are the tools we need to create this entire ecosystem? Now, this picture, which I showed you initially for like, okay, here's a microfluidic device, uh, you know, a simple device where you can put tiny volumes of fluids and manipulate stuff around. Now, the thing was, you know, I was kind of cheating over here because in reality for every picture that looks like this, you have this entire chaos of a setup that actually makes that one tiny chip go. And so if you actually had a design center like this, you know, 90% of this would be filled with like pumps and instruments for actually doing measurements and actuation rather than the actual biology itself. And so people in academia were like, can we take any ideas from like the semiconductor world and really, really integrate all this stuff into like a single device? And they did a pretty good job. So over the last, you know, 15 years or so, people have been like outdoing themselves to make better and better devices uh, from like the year 2002 itself, I guess. So they made all these devices, but the issue was, you know, like all of these were like one and done. They never made a second version of these devices. So now the big question was, and if you wanted to use a tool like 3 to create them, you mean, good luck, I wouldn't want to do it. And it's my tool, right? So we were like, is there an easier way to actually design these devices? So we looked at electronics, right? And as you all already know, I'm basically an electronics guy trying to 
tell microfluidics engineers how to do stuff. So I was like, okay, if I wanted to create a new uh, micro, um, new electronic IC, I would use something like Viralog, you know, a high level description language. It'll compile down to like the actual gates of what needs to get done. And then, you know, I make an ISAC out of it or I put it in a PGA and I'm done and I'm, and I'm done and happy. So my advisor was like, okay, maybe we can describe how, you know, like liquids interact. Sorry, that's a super bad impersonation. I'm not good at these things. But that basically became the genesis of this design language called LFR, which I worked on throughout my, uh, through, towards the end of my PhD, uh, which is my thesis, to figure out a way to like actually describe these microfluidic designs. And so what I basically did was I kind of copied uh, uh, Verilog and took out all the electronics pieces and put in like all the microfluidics related keywords. And basically now I had like a, my, a design language for describing microfluidics. And not only could I just, you know, like uh, put in all the different microfluidic uh, related terminology, I could also reuse some of the ideas from Verilog for like describing, you know, operations, uh, describing complex logic, for in our cases for like how we distribute fluids and how we uh, valve things in and out. I could also, you know, like eventually describe super complex logic uh, devices in microfluidics, which, you know, like were also one and done devices and which nobody ever wants to recreate again by manual. So now with this entire uh, ecosystem of, you know, like this design language compilers and everything in there, using the manufacturing library in 3DUF, I created this uh, other tool called Neptune, where we could basically, you know, a cloud-based IDE so that for folks who are not super savvy, which are like the microfluidics engineers or the biologists doing this, could quickly go in, create a description in LFR and ma uh, compile the final design outputs. So now what I have is that if you have an idea for creating microfluidic devices, you can use one of my design tools, whether it's Neptune or 3DUF, then that in turn would use like different languages involved, different algorithms that we've been building to generate like the final designs uh, and CAD files, which you need for actually manufacturing these devices. And you have like a microfluidic device on head. Now, the best part about all of this is that because everything is open source, if you're like a microfluidics engineer, you come up with a new kind of component design, new way of cap, uh, characterizing it, you can basically plug in all your data. You can plug in all your logic into my uh, into the design tool chain. And if you were an algorithm designer, you could actually extend the language to actually do more comp uh, computational design automation kind of work. And that was one of the big things in the acad academic space because you know there were like twenty groups doing different things. Nobody was actually integrating anything together. So you know we would always start from like uh, uh, square one every single time. But the real question for me and the real reason is that even though we could do all this lab automation, that's what required in my PhD, these are the kind of stories which really made me want to do this, you know, like why I spent so much time building this stack. So in this picture is Karpai Village uh, from a place where I was kind of volunteering with this organization, health center in this village. Now in this area, you know, like there's one doctor for about 5,000 patients. And 90% of this uh, population, tribal population over here has malaria and everybody is below the poverty line. So one of the big pro questions that they were facing was, you know, like, is the malaria uh, parasite getting drug resistant? And the problem was that, how can we actually test this? Because, you know, it wasn't easy for them. These are just doctors in like uh, low resource clinical settings, right? And so, you know, like, me being in Boston, in the mecca of biotech, you know, this seemed like a pretty simple question to answer. Uh, 15 minutes later, I realized that two people uh, are using one, some of the tech from a guy working across the street and some other paper, we could actually create like an integrated device with a bunch of engineering could eventually do this test. But the thing is that this device is never going to happen because for most researchers, including me, this problem is so alien and so not in our least path, uh, in path for our funding, we would never actually work on it. For startups, you know, the saviors of the world, you know, this is not going to be a lucrative exit, so they won't work on it. And for the community, the doctors over there, maybe the biohackers in the area, they would probably be confused about how to even go about making these kinds of devices. 
And so that's kind of where, you know, we, I started putting together this small community called distributed diagnostics that would, you know, create like all the free, use all the free CAD tools, put together all the DIY manufacturing techniques we've been doing in our lab and create a community that has some tools to actually start solving problems which they're interested in. And uh, that, you know, like, and, you know, like, that's about it. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any time. I unfortunately can't see how much time is left here. We actually have a few minutes maybe to uh, discuss some stuff. So maybe you could give us a first, just for people who've never used microfluidics before, um, and maybe aren't ready to start designing their own devices, what's like a great place for them to get started? Yeah, so uh, some of my undergrads, the ones who worked on like the design automation kind of a thing for synthetic biology, they put together this great wiki with like videos, resources, uh, you know, those videos were so good. I was like, oh my God, you guys spent so much time on these things. <laughs> but that's a great place to start. And I have a lot of long tutorials. You actually just had to bear with me talking over like how to design microfluidics. What is the but, URL for uh, that wiki? Is it distributeddiagnostics.org? No, uh, I'll be putting that wiki uh, link right now. Uh, oh, awesome. Thank you. You can also follow so, up after in the Discord. Everybody has questions. Yeah. So I put it in the studio link over yeah, there. Yeah, I'll, I'll cross post it. Awesome. Yeah, and so, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, and I think that's a great place to start. I also have a lot of tutorials around this. Uh, I'll be putting up more URLs for like all the detailed tutorials nice. on how to access. Right, maybe even at like a higher level. Can you explain for someone yeah. who like really doesn't know, like what even are microfluidics for? Why is this useful? Yeah. Um, so think of it this way, right? Like if you're doing any kind of bio biology or chem chemistry research, the fundamental thing that you do is you need to mix a couple of fluids together or you need to manipulate some fluids. And so what microfluidics kind of do is they allow you to automate that whole process because let's say if you gave me a pipette, none of my friends who are like actual biologists would trust me to even pipe at the right volume. But if it's a device, they'd be like, you know what, the device will take care of making sure there's the right volume that's mixing, it's mixing at the right ratio. And you know, so what you're I saying is, if here, you but, wanted to do a yeah. lot of diagnostic tests with just one drop of blood, you could do it this way. <laughs> so, you know, that's how. This is what Theranos said they would do, you know, uh, but uh, Theranos with Theranos. But yeah, but that's basically what we're trying to do, right? We want to make biology research more reproducible. And that's kind of why we want to do microfluidics because, you know, the dirty little secret is that most biology research is not reproducible. And when you're doing synthetic biology, it's so hard to engineer those systems that you need to make sure that every protocol is captured to the dot and, you know, nothing actually changes. So having those really precise reproducible conditions is important. And the second thing is because microfluidics actually use like micro and nanoliters of volume, it means that, you know, like the reagent cost is gonna be a lot lesser. Like for example, some reagents which we buy are like $500 for like 10 ml. And so if you have, if you use nanoliters of it to do the same experiment, one, you have better sensitivity, two, you have cost savings and you could use a 10 ml for like the next six months rather than for like a week. Cool, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, there are a lot of people who are engaged in open source hardware from the electronics part and maybe some who are engaged from uh, mechanical design, but uh, bio, bio and uh, laboratory testing kinds of things are really uh, maybe something that a lot of people are recently wanting to get into. So I think a lot of people are super excited about any links or resources that you can share about the kind of work that you do. No, definitely. Uh, feel free to hit me up on the Discord. Uh, I work with a lot of like community bio labs in the Boston area, Bay Area and stuff. So it'll be exciting to just talk to more people and connect with them. And we're always looking for open source contributors. We have so much work and not enough people to do them. So Amazing. Yeah. Maybe you have some uh, community bio labs that you want to give a shout out to right now. Uh, so I've been recently talking to Braid Theory folks and there's Boss Lab in the Boston area. 
then Counterculture Labs, and uh, I'm so blanking out on all the names I know <laughs> uh, right now. Here in Seattle, uh, Sound yeah. Bio. Exactly. There's so many folks around here, and they're all so exciting, you know, like to work with. Uh, there's a question for, are there non-health or human applications for microfluidics? Um, there are some environmental applications. We had one person come into the uh, distributed diagnostics for who wanted to like check uh, different environmental applications. Like for example, monitoring to see, you know, if there are like heavy metals in the environment or also like separating out different types of, uh, not sure, different types of fungi and bacteria in the particular ecosphere. So there are all kinds of crazy things you can do. Think of it this way. If there's something you want to do with fluids, uh, like some kind of a liquid, and you want to automate it, microfluidics is one potential way of doing it. Cool, cool. Well, this has been really great. Thank you so much.